Uh, just a quick note that this uh, meeting is being recorded so that people can view it at a later time. If you registered, which you did if you're here, you will receive a link to the recording in a few days time. Uh, so welcome, my name is Sarah Lowenberg and I am the manager of education at the Louisiana State Museum. And it's my privilege to be able to welcome you all here for this month's installment of the second Thursday lecture series um, hosted in partnership with the Friends of the Cabildo. Um, this month, we are thrilled to be able to hear from Shane Leaf and from John McCusker, um, the authors and photographers of Giacomo, the native roots of Mardi Gras Indians. Um, as a quick note, uh, I mentioned we're recording also with this virtual platform. We're all slowly but surely getting used to it, but please be sure to mute yourselves during the program since sound can um, be exaggerated in this setting. And if I do mute you on your behalf, it's not because we don't wanna hear from you, it's just because of how it works. Um, next month also on December 10th, our next program will be with Linnell Thomas who will be speaking on her previous book, Desire and Disaster in New Orleans, Tourism, Race and Historical Memory as well as on an upcoming project. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce the speakers. They will each then speak um, and share some images and background. And afterwards, we'll have some time for questions and answers. But I encourage you to use the chat box throughout the program to drop your, drop your questions as they come to you. Um, and then we'll use that chat box um, to field questions after the presentation. Um, so tonight we're hearing from Shane Leaf, who was born and raised in New Orleans. He holds two master's degrees in linguistics and musicology and is currently a PhD candidate in linguistics at Tulane. Over the past decade, he has presented papers at the annual meetings of the American Musicolog Musicological Society, the American Anthropological Society Association, and the Society for German American Studies and the Louisiana Historical Association. The most recent linguistics course he designed and taught at Tulane was the evolution of English in Louisiana. And when not teaching or writing about the history of languages, he plays music and leads a percussion band that marches in Mardi Gras parades. John McCusker is a photojournalist who has worked for the Times Picayune for 26 years and the New Orleans Advocate for five. His previous book, Creole Trombone, focuses on Kid Ori and he's currently working to open the 1811 Kid Ori Historic House in La Place. His images are featured in Giacomo. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over first to Shane. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to uh, everybody, all of your colleagues and bringing us together tonight. Uh, it's really a great opportunity to uh, have a conversation and uh, yeah, John and I uh, came out with our book last year, and um, as you're mentioning, it's, it contains so much of his work over many years, and, and it is a visual odyssey, really, with his photography and archival photos, too. Um, and I'm coming at it from another angle, uh, having studied the history of languages, and, and I think what I'd like to talk about tonight uh, focuses more on the history of the languages in the region. And I'm going to switch over to uh, my presentation here so everyone can see that together. Okay, so yeah, here's our uh, book cover. And uh, it actually is, uh, it, it gives you exactly what you're going to get once you open it up, but of course, a whole lot more. Uh, Giacomo and the native roots of Mardi Gras Indians. Uh, we certainly do explore that specific aspect, uh, the, the native traditions and the native people who uh, really were here before anyone else and whose musical traditions have had an impact on New Orleans music, even though this is something that has not been discussed very much and has seems to have been left out of a lot of uh, discussions, uh, even in uh, the universities and in our popular culture, but uh, the native element is, is certainly there and the uh, title itself is a through line. It's a linguistic through line. So Giacomo, you know, where does this come from? It has lots of meanings, but in the book, we talk about the unmistakable native 
roots of uh, Giacomo. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that tonight, but I also wanna talk about how different language families were being blended over many centuries here in the lower Mississippi River Valley. So it's a confluence of musical traditions as well as languages and, uh, and families uh, growing and, and living together and uh, basically uh, you know, creating a, a, new, a new civilization together, a new culture. So when I started studying music in New Orleans, one of the images that I saw that struck me was this one. And I remember looking at this in history books and there was really no explanation, no, at least not an elaborate explanation. So a lot of my curiosity actually came from what is this image? You know, this purports to be a scene in, at the very beginning of New Orleans around the time of its establishment in 1718. And I always wondered about it. So a lot of my own curiosity, which led to writing this book with John came from wondering what this image meant. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So first we'll pan out and look at the whole region. Uh, here's a, uh, a map from the mid 18th century uh, about the time that uh, L'Histoire de la Louisiane was published. This is the, the work by Lepage de Prats, a very important colonial uh, document. And uh, I wanna strip away all the names here. So we have uh, a kind of river vision and look at the waterways and think about the features that really have shaped us and primarily the Mississippi River. So this is also a story of different languages and different interpretations of sounds. Um, as many of you already know, Mississippi is an Algonquian word, uh, a name meaning big river or great river. And throughout the colonial period, you had different interpretations of this name. Uh, so it gets interpreted by Spanish speakers and French speakers in different ways. You can see this reflected in the spellings. Uh, so sometimes people may have heard Mississippi or Mississippi and see all these variations on this theme. Uh, well, this also to, to European ears, it got a little mutated, you know, people were reinterpreting it, but also to other uh, native groups in the lower Mississippi River Valley who spoke Muscogean languages, uh, they heard this. And here's a spelling that Lepage de Potts recorded, and he translates this as Old Father of Waters. So notice now it's not Big River anymore, but it's uh, Old Father of Waters. But it really is something uh, that it sounds similar to Mississippi, but it's not, uh, something like Mississippi. And so this is the Algonquian uh, name being interpreted by Muscogean ears and Muscogean speakers. And so this, this becomes uh, Mississippi, and a lot of us have grown up knowing about Mississippi as Big River, but also as uh, the Old Man or Old Man River. And that's, that's why it has a couple of different interpretations because one is Algonquian and one is a Muscogean interpretation of an Algonquian name. Now, speaking of Muscogean languages, uh, another name that I think is probably fairly familiar to many of you by now, uh, especially with the tricentennial of New Orleans, uh, Bulbansha, uh, which can be interpreted as a place of foreign languages uh, uh, derived, uh, at least in Choctaw, uh, Choctaw being one of the Muscogean languages, uh, Balbaha, uh, someone who speaks a foreign language, a foreign language speaker, and Asha, meaning uh, there are people who speak foreign languages. So it could be interpreted as either a place of foreign languages or a place of foreign language speakers. And interestingly, throughout the colonial period, there are recordings of this referring to the river and then later to the city of New Orleans. So by the 19th century, uh, certainly by the mid 19th century uh, and a little bit earlier, Balbansha was the Choctaw name for New Orleans. And throughout the colonial period, you have different references to the river with these different spellings. So you have La Page de Prats, uh, Montigny says uh, Barbansha. And oftentimes you'll see this in languages where if someone is speaking a language that doesn't have a certain phoneme or a sound in their own language, they'll reinterpret it. And you'll see this with many languages where an L get uh, transposed to an R. And this is what happened with some people. Now this is not Montigny, but he may have heard other peoples living in the region who referred to it as Barbancha as opposed to Balbancha. Sometimes you'll see Malbanchia or some variation thereof. Uh, again, clearly related, but uh, again, with the bilabial B, the B sound gets reinterpreted as, a, as a, an M sound for some people. And there's other variants besides. 
Uh, so there's all these, uh, if you think about it, all these different groups of people that are coming together and they're trying to make sense of one another and they're borrowing these names, but in the process, changing the sounds and sometimes changing the meaning too. Now, here's one other uh, variant on this. And I think this is interesting because it comes from a painting that many of us are familiar with. This is the painting by Debats from 1735, uh, which uh, depicts uh, the area around New Orleans. And uh, you'll see that there are many different uh, groups, native groups represented in this image. One thing that was missed by a lot of historians in the past, or at least they didn't comment very much on it, was at the very bottom, there is an inscription that says Balba Hacha. And it's really fascinating. You can see right away it's related to Balbansha. Uh, it's not quite Balbansha though. In fact, uh, it is derived from Choctaw, uh, Balbaha, someone who speaks in a foreign language, and Hacha, a river. So then literally it's the river of foreign language speakers. As, as you can see, it's it, very similar to Balbansha, Balba Hacha. And of course, uh, with Acha, it conjures up lots of other uh, names like Achafalaya, the Hacha, the Acha at the beginning is clearly a reference to a river. But uh, this is yet another variation on this theme. So again, as people are meeting one another, they're borrowing uh, words from each other and they're borrowing sounds, sometimes uh, the meanings will change too, which is relevant to Giacomo. So to get back to this image, uh, you know, when John and I were working on the book, uh, of course, we found a, a better version of this, a more detailed version. And this is the one that we use uh, that's, that appears in the book. And this is specifically a, a peace pipe or Calumet uh, march uh, in New Orleans that took place in 1718, although it was published later, 40 years later, it's referring to events four decades earlier. And the Calumet ceremony, uh, it's often used synonymously with peace pipe ceremony, even though that's not quite the case. The Calumet is a, uh, a very complex phenomenon over many centuries, and it has lots of meanings over time, and I'll, I'll get into some of that. But Calumet is cognate with Chalumeau, uh, which is the French word for reed, and that's that long stem uh, that you see in the pipe. I'll go back just for a moment. And you'll see at the top, the, the, the very first person who's in that uh, single file line dancing is holding the Calumet, and you can see the feathers that are uh, hanging below it, uh, and, and the, the pipe, uh, th that person, that one dancer is holding the, the, uh, the pipe as you would smoke it, but with a bowl out on the end. And um, so, the, it, but it wasn't just for smoking. So what happened was uh, when the Calumet ceremony was taking place, of course, there would be a sharing of uh, the tobacco and the, and the pipe, but there would be get gifts that were given back and forth. Uh, people would sometimes give speeches that would last a long time, sometimes even uh, for days. And uh, a lot of the French uh, you know, colonial governors and others may not have always understood what was happening. And they would sometimes get a little tired of that and they would wanna cut it short, but that was really uh, quite a faux pas because you know, it actually was much longer than what they thought it would be. Uh, lots of singing and playing of percussion instruments. But also it was very intimate. Um, the participants in the ceremony would uh, actually physically rub one another on their, on their stomachs, uh, on their hands, and they would carry each other too. So uh, if you think about it, it wasn't simply the, the peace pipe itself. The peace pipe was a participant though. In fact, uh, understood as a, an animate participant, another being, a sacred being that was part of the whole ceremony. So with those feathers, you, you would see on the pipe, those were understood as being perhaps like wings and the person who's holding the peace pipe and dancing would sometimes uh, make it dance too or fly through the air. And there's some very interesting um, accounts in the uh, 1670s when uh, the Jesuit missionary Marquette was, was coming down the Mississippi River and we have some of our very first, uh, very elaborate descriptions of the Calumet ceremony from Marquette. And he talks about how when they're meeting people and they're, they're engaged in the Calumet ceremony, uh, the, the pipe is flying around as though it were a bird. So it's, it's really uh, certainly a, a, like a part, a, a participant in the ceremony. And so just to get, give you an idea, the Calumet ceremony also many centuries before had been something that was associated with a, a kinship ritual. 
So if someone was becoming adopted by another group, uh, the Calumet was present and it was, it was used as part of that. And it seems that uh, in the 1600s, uh, certainly among Algonquian speakers, the Calumet was increasingly used as a, a kind of a, a token of, uh, or a diplomatic ceremony. So it really was a matter of war and peace. You know, people would uh, uh, create diplomatic relations with the Calumet. And of course, you know, the French discovered it didn't always work that way. But um, one thing that's really fascinating to think about with the Calumet is that the French did have a role in spreading this ceremonialism down the river. So by the time you get to say the, the establishment of New Orleans uh, in the second decade of the 18th century, uh, the French are now uh, using the Calumet themselves that they're carrying uh, extra Calumets around with them. And they realize that when they meet other groups that they perhaps haven't met before, they will, um, they will engage in this ceremony. And in fact, um, you know, at Old Mobile, there's also been archaeological work uh, done showing how the French were manufacturing the pipe bowls themselves. So they, by then, they had really understood the, the significance of this, at least in that diplomatic uh, dimension. Uh, although, again, not so surprising, the French weren't always aware of the spiritual uh, or all the spiritual uh, connotations of this. Um, so here we have that image uh, in New Orleans at the very beginning of New Orleans, 1718. Uh, specifically, it's the Chitty Macha who are engaged in this, and this is concluding a war that uh, took place between the French and uh, the Chitty Macha. And uh, this really does amount to be the first documented musical procession in public space in New Orleans. You know, something incredibly important for the history of the music of the city, and it was something that, you know, for me and John, like we were very astounded that this wasn't discussed before in musical accounts and was somehow separated out from the uh, European and African derived musical traditions. But as it turns out, uh, a very integral part to uh, New Orleans. And uh, it wasn't just at the beginning of the city. It actually, um, there were many diplomatic uh, missions to the city from different uh, native groups uh, involving a Calumet ceremony all throughout the Spanish, both the French and the Spanish uh, colonial regimes. So it was something that was continuously present, continuously practiced uh, at this time. And uh, so just to get into some of the details of uh, L'Histoire de la Louisiane or La Page de Prats, uh, I went back to the French version and was combing through some of it, found some details that had been overlooked in some previous English translations. Um, one part that I thought was really fascinating was when they were, uh, Lepage de Prats is describing what happened with the Calumet ceremony. So here we have more details uh, for that image that we saw. Um, and he explains that he was with Bienville when the Chirimacha arrived by river on, on pirogues and they advanced and they were dancing and singing the song of the Calumet, which they shook in the air and in rhythm, or en cadence. And again, they weren't merely shaking it. The, the thing that La Page de Prats may not have understood was that the pipe was alive and was dancing along with the other participants. And at the same time, uh, the uh, Chitty Macha, uh, as other groups, they were shaking these gourd rattles known as uh, shishi kwa. And uh, speaking of languages and uh, words that are being uh, borrowed from one language to another, Shishikwa, uh, as far as we understand, was originally a term that was used by Algonquian speaker, speakers uh, in the upper Mississippi River Valley, but then that got borrowed into all these other languages. And of course, it's also onomatopoeic. So Shishikwa actually is the, the sound that the gourd rattle makes. It's, it's kind of announcing its own name. Uh, when you when you say shishikwa, this is exactly what it what it says when it's being played. So uh, and it's an interesting word that also gets borrowed into French, and you'll see references to shishikwa not just in Le Page de Prats, but in other uh, colonial documents as well. And uh, so throughout our book, we have uh, a few images of the different types of uh, instruments associated with the calumet. Uh, here in this image, you see at the top uh, the the calumet itself but also bells. And at the bottom, uh, you see representations of, uh, well, not only a drum, but uh, also the gourd rattles too. Um, so these are these would be examples of the shishikwa. And you can see, in fact, 
in the lower right hand corner, the legend number four, it identifies these as Shishikwa. Okay, so this is, uh, th these were the instruments that usually were uh, associated with the ceremony. Uh, um, now, besides the musical instruments, uh, the, the language that was being used at that time, uh, ceremonially, it makes sense. I mean, you, you can imagine that it was the Chittimacha who were singing in their own language, but at the same time, they would switch back and forth. And sometimes they would use uh, what Le Page de Prats refers to as la langue vulgaire, which really more than likely refers to Mobilian jargon. And uh, for those of you uh, perhaps not familiar with this, Mobilian jargon was the language that was spoken all throughout what would become the Southeastern United States. Uh, not only by indigenous groups, but also Europeans, African Americans, everybody who was here. And um, they had different names for it. So at the bottom, I, I give you some examples of how Bienville refers to Bayugula. It could be the language of the Bayugula, but at the same time, more than likely in that context, he was referring to a Mobilian jargon. Uh, some people say uh, Choctaw trade language to this day. Uh, some people that I know refer to it that way. Uh, it's also known as uh, yama, which is the word for yes, uh, but it's also in a spiritual context, uh, yama means uh, amen. And some people would say that this is some evidence for Mobilian jargon, not just being a trade language, but it might have been a uh, liturgical language uh, very anciently. So there's all kinds of possibilities with uh, this language. But suffice it to say that it was spoken by all these different groups in the lower Mississippi River Valley. And when it comes to uh, Giacomo in particular, um, what John and I had discovered was that all throughout the colonial period, there are references to uh, a phrase that we used in the context of greeting, uh, a chokma fina in, Choc in Choctaw. And uh, over time, a chokma fina, it was heard by different speakers of different languages, just like Mississippi became Mississippi, uh, or Balbantia becomes Marbantia or Malbantia for some people. Uh, some people heard uh, a chocomofina and they heard something like chocomofino or chocomofindo. And, um, and, and in fact, this is one of the things that uh, you know, John and I have talked about a lot, but you see these songs in the 20th century, not just Ico Ico, but um, chocomofindo, hey, uh, that's, uh, these are all echoes of a chukmafina, different variations of that. And, and finally, it also becomes uh, Giacomo with a J. And there's a, there's a funny story about that too. And that's, that's in the book. I'll save that for uh, anyone who is reading the book. But it's, it's something that was mutating all this time. And it does get interpreted as having many different meanings, of course, which is okay. But just to be able to identify that indigenous uh, root I think is, has been one of the things that uh, we offer in the book and uh, talking about how that uh, changes over time. Now, uh, by uh, the civil, past the Civil War and Reconstruction, there were still uh, Native groups in the vicinity of New Orleans, oftentimes at the, at the French market. Uh, here's a depiction uh, in a magazine. Uh, in the book, we, we chose to use a sketch that was the basis of that image uh, by Alfred Wode, because it's just so interesting. It shows so much more of the, the life of uh, and the animacy of, of the market uh, scene. And um, this is just to say that people who are native, not only are they here now too, they always have been here, but all throughout the history of New Orleans, they were present. And uh, besides things like uh, Giacomo, the, the, the lyric, uh, you also have reflexes in instrumentation. So there's this Choctaw drum that was uh, still being played at the beginning of the 20th century uh, in Bayou Lacombe across the lake. And if you look at it, just the detail of it, it really does strike you as being something perhaps more of African origin, like a conga drum. So extremely unusual for this region, for the Southeastern United States. You don't, you don't see drums like this uh, that are played by uh, native groups. And, uh, but it, it does seem to embody, and in fact, I believe it does embody this um, nexus of cultural traditions so that by the time you, you come to the 20th century, you really do have a blend of 
African, Native, and European musical traditions all at once. And so our book uh, really brings that together uh, for the first time. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to share with you. And uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Shane. Um, as we shift over to John, as a reminder, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to John. Sorry, I muted you. Am I there now? We're good. Okay. Well, uh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for uh, for tuning in. Um, I'm I came at the story from a little bit different angle. Uh, you know, what's really good about what Shane and I put together is uh, is he knew all the stuff I didn't know, and I kind of had the stuff he hadn't done, and it it all sort of came together that way. And what I mean by that is that. My uh, main career was as a photographer at the Times Picayune, and I'm a New Orleans native, and I had an opportunity over 20 years to photograph the Indians, not just on the streets on Mardi Gras, but so in their suits at Indian practice and even a couple of funerals. And I got to know a lot of them, and the whole time that I'm taking those pictures over the course of Mardi Gras after Mardi Gras, the back of my mind, I'm going, gosh, I just, I want to figure out more about this history. It just had my curiosity up and I was in the middle of working on another book at the time on Kidori. So the time came around that I finally put that down, got things settled and hooked up with Shane and finally said, all right, well, let's, let's see what we can do. Now Shane's covering the, the you know his phase of it and we really sort of looked at this starting out at what you hear uh and what i heard elders like city montana and robbie lee say um when i asked him about the origin of the indians and you and you generally hear the same thing over and over again which is that it emerged sometime after the civil war as an homage to the relationships between people of African ancestry and Native Americans before emancipation. So since Shane was kind of on the uh, on the case on the second part of that, which I know I could have never figured out. Um, and uh, so what I did was I came at it from the other side. I mean, I was a newspaper photographer. I know what's going on now. I know the guys that are doing it now. I know what they say. I photographed them. I've seen what they do. And while I'm talking about that, how about we uh, look at some pictures? Everybody seeing pretty pictures now? Okay. Um, this was the first Mardi Gras after Katrina, uh, which had all kinds of uh, special feelings uh, to it beyond just a regular Mardi Gras. Um, <clears throat> so I spent time, uh, whoops. This is uh, Central City here, that's Jay Williams. Jay's a long shoreman when he's not looking pretty and running down Second Street in Central City. That's Juan Pardo. Um, we known each other, I guess, about 20 years now. He's about 5'4", but he comes down the street in that Indian suit. You never know it. And uh, and he's a good performer. He also performs musically uh, around the city. It's a big chief, Al Womble and Angelique Briscoe. This is the Cheyenne. They come mm -hmm. out down Dryde Street in Central City. This is Big Chief Bo Dallas Jr. He took over the Wild Magnolias after his father, Bo Dallas, died. And we talk a lot about his father, particularly in the section about music. Uh, the recordings of the Wild Magnolias led by Bo's father, Bo Dallas Sr., um, were just epic recordings in the history of New Orleans music. 
first Mardi Gras after Katrina. This is uh, the ninth ward. And this was uh, the first year I followed the Indians. This is 96, which is why there's no one in the background with the cell phone. But after I was following them for a while and saw the Mardi Gras stuff, you know, I started going in and watching the process and watching as they sketched out their ideas for the patches on their suits on canvas and in the process of sewing them, which just goes on for months. Um, things I wouldn't have thought about on the right, uh, you'll see Pepe Eugene there and he just took in a shipment of feathers and you've got to go through and break the feathers. So you've got to, is, is it from the left side or the right side of the bird? So you've got to separate all those out because it becomes significant in how you uh, put together the Indian suit. On Sundays, they have Indian practice and at bars around the, around the city, uh, you'll have like a particular Indian tribe. They used to call them gangs, but that's kind of, uh, people don't use that term anymore. So they just say tribes again now. Um, they would have a bar that was their hangout and Indians from other um, parts of the city would come in and they'd have a dance off, a face off. And this is the, uh, this is, I believe the, uh, this is Ivory Homes at Kemp's Lounge, which is, doesn't exist anymore. It was in Central City. And the signifying he's doing there is that he spotted Indians from another tribe of coming to the bar. Ivory passed away about three years ago. Big Chief Tutti Montana and Big Chief Robbie Lee, um, I was very fortunate enough to get to, to spend some time with both these men and to photograph both of them. Um, they were part of our starting point beyond the basic origin sentence that I just gave you. They offered a prism back um, at least to the beginning of the 20th century. Tootie having been born in 1922, Robbie in 1915. But uh, Tootie, you know, his family had been in the Indian thing a long time. And the story that he told was not one that he knew firsthand. It had been told to him by his grandmother. And it was of his great uncle, B.K. Baptiste, who we discovered was B.K. Baptiste Eugene. And he he lived uh, on St. Anthony Street in the Seventh Ward. And Tootie told a story about an Indian gang, as they called it, although they say it's the first one. It may just be this particular one was founded there. Those things get muddled sometimes in stories over time. But they say that that's where the Creole Wild West was founded sometime in the mid 1880s. Okay, good enough, that's a wrap, right? Well, we looked at that a little bit. And since we had a name, BK Baptiste, that's a good starting place. And then also Robbie told me a lot of stories about Brother Tillman. Uh, Brother Cornelius Tillman uh, was, a, was a rough customer. He, uh, he spent a lot of time in the parish as uh, Dr. John used to say, um, he was a really bad Indian. You know, he sh shot somebody on Mardi Gras one year and you still hear, you know, in lore among living Indians, you know, about brother Tillman. He died in the 1950s. Well, Robbie knew all these people and he told me about them. So we started going, turn the way back machine back and just started going back and trying to see what there was on the record about what we call today Mardi Gras Indians. And what I found quickly was beginning in the 1920s, really the 1910s, they're mentioned just about every year. Okay, so we had that. So it's, we started clawing back a little bit 
And looky here what we found, 1903, the Times Democrat. And the caption of the photo was, quote, a band of Mardi Gras Indians. And this is, this is a fascinating photo because you've got, look at all the different takes on Indianness. And we'll talk about that term a little more in a minute. You see here, you know, the guy in the center has got something more of a turban with a feather or two coming off of it. Uh, the guys on the left have something that you might more associate with, you know, uh, a Liberty head coin or something with his spikes coming out. No, the guy on the right has a textile on and a wrap looking far more African uh, there. So very interesting takes. And it looks like a whole lot of them are wearing long johns with just stuff over them and so forth. But a much different idea of, you know, an Indian suit than what we have today. So I kept clawing back and looking at images and Th these both knock my socks off. On the left, you've got uh, from the book, The Great South, the record of journeys of Louisiana and the Indian Territory, uh, <clears throat> uh, put together by this guy, Edward King. Uh, we found this etching and look at this guy. He just shows up right there in the picture. This is 1875. And then over here, our friend Mark Twain, whoops, let's go back. Our friend Mark Twain here, this is an etching from an illustration of Mardi Gras and life on the Mississippi. And the central picture is an Indian wrestling with the bear. So I said, well, that's interesting. So obviously the Indian character uh, if you will, is something that's firmly established at least as back as 1875. Well, what I also found in kind of sifting back through this was that, you know, when we look at the Mardi Gras Indians today and we see them, you know, as a group, you know, typically a neighborhood group that gets together and masks together and goes out, uh, they were one of many uh, if you look uh, sent back a century, century and a half ago, it was very typical for neighborhoods or groups or organizations to have a group masking theme. And they would all go out with the same outfits and do the same kind of behaviors and shticks and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one of them was the white monkeys. Uh, they would dress up in these white body suits with these grotesque masks and walk around. And in their tails, they would have marbles. And if anybody gave them any trouble, they'd swing those tails around and crack you with the marbles. Uh, Louis Armstrong tells the story of how his father used to mask as a white monkey on Mardi Gras and how he, he had this tail filled with marbles. And the guy on the right here is, is Louis Armstrong's father, Willie. Uh, and just to show how these traditions all, all cross over on each other, we're gonna talk a little bit more later about benevolent societies. Uh, Louis's father is dressed in his regalia as the Grand Marshal of the Odd Fellows organization in this picture. So the Indian as an image, as a caricature, as a stereotype emerged early on uh, in all sorts of places in American life uh, before the Civil War and onward uh, in coinage. Uh, and as a visual image, you'll see that it changed over time. The 1863 coin in the center right, <clears throat> it's a rather Greco-Roman take on a Native American, whereas if you look at the buffalo head uh, coin on the bottom left, that was drawn from three live models who were used to create that image. 
in the top uh, image, if you've ever heard someone say the eagle flies on Friday, uh, that is a turn of the century golden eagle coin. So when someone says the eagle flies on Friday, meaning that's payday. You'll hear that lyric in a lot of blues songs. And here's just sort of a grotesque commodification of the Indian image. On the left, we have very proud Seminole royal, uh, warrior, indeed, Billy Bowlegs, uh, who fought in the second and third Seminole rebellions. He was one of the last guys to, uh, to surrender and, and agree to relocation in Oklahoma. When you think of the Mardi Gras Indians, one of their themes is I won't bow down, no hum bow. Um, and certainly someone like Billy Bowlegs was representative of that idea. And then you look at this, at this gross, just uh, appropriation of that image. And that is what the image of Indians was reduced to by the time of the Civil War. All right, so let's flash forward past the Civil War. That's where we kind of left off our Indian story. We had images of Indians. We, you know, as early as 1900, we've got these drawings of people dressed as Indians. And going back, Shane found something remarkable. And I'll just make sort of a side note about this, about the history of Mardi Gras, because we haven't really talked about that. A lot of times it's easy to get the impression that Mardi Gras started in 1856 when they founded the first old line cruise and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, Mardi Gras had always been celebrated in New Orleans. Um, you know, Shane found an example of, I think, the late 1720s and a couple of guys are bored on Lundy Gras and they decide to put on costumes and go out and have a party and a couple of them dress as Indians. That's like 1729, Shane. Yeah, um, you know, costuming and so forth were always big in Mardi Gras. It was just in the 1850s that we had the parades and, you know, sort of the appropriation of Mardi Gras by the sort of the same class and same people that spent many decades trying to put it down. All right, so we're coming out of the end of the Civil War and more accurately, the end of Reconstruction. The federal troops are gone. There's not fair representation. Black folks are driven from the polls and they're basically catching hell again. Uh, as Reconstruction has ended, PBS Pinchback, uh, briefly governor of the state of Louisiana himself, a veteran of the United States Colored Infantry and before that, the Corps d'Afrique, uh, in the Civil War, um, suggested that the Freedmen form mutual aid and benevolent societies to discuss the issues of the day and help each other out. In other words, create a forum uh, where you could keep your community together, uh, create a patchwork, uh, help each other out because the federal government just backed out on us and all we've got is each other. That was basically the thrust of what Pinchback was saying, and these organizations were founded all through New Orleans, the hinterlands, uh, everywhere. So this is a period we're talking about 1878, 1879, 1880. And lo and behold, uh, if you go to Lafayette Cemetery number two on Washington Avenue in New Orleans and go to the back, you'll see the results of PBS Pinchback's declaration. That's where all, all the tombs are of the 19th century post-reconstruction benevolent societies that were founded in that neighborhood and throughout New Orleans for these people to take care of each other. And the basic purpose of the organization was to care for the sick and bury the dead. Sort of a homespun HMO uh, along with burial insurance. And when you died, you're, along with your funeral being paid for, you got a brass band to escort you to the hereafter. Well, there were dozens of these organizations, but there's only one left now, and that's the Young Men of Olympian Junior Benevolent Association. And they were kind enough to let me attend a meeting in 1997. And you'd go to the secret location. It's secret because they're collecting money. 
you know, it's like going, everybody's going there to make a bank deposit. Uh, so you go there and it was kind of like the wizard of Oz, you know, you knock on the door and the people goes back. Yes. Um, and this man was there, the people closed and a few minutes later, the door went open and that's the young men of Olympian. And these societies institutionalized what we now consider the jazz funeral. But they were doing this years before that music actually came into being. It's still carried out today by a number of organizations, including the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club. This is Harold Dudley. He was the Grand Marshal uh, for decades at Zulu. And we've got the young brass band players that are still on the streets playing for these processions and for these funerals today, just as Louis Armstrong did 100 years ago. And just as people like James Humphrey did 130 years ago. And these Sunday parades are were a typical regular feature of these societies along with funerals for their members. And really what we put together there and, and what we offered, not as a conclusion, uh, but just as sort of uh, an idea or thought to throw into the mix. What we found in this period uh, after Reconstruction, when we've got the founding of these benevolent societies um, and sort of this organizing effort going on in the black community we also were lucky enough through news accounts and arrest records to discover the names of 19th century Mardi Gras Indians, people that were doing it in the 19th century. And once we were able to do that, we were able to talk about people, not thing, you know, not Mardi Gras Indians. Let's talk about, uh, Jerry Henry, let's talk about BK Baptiste. So that brings us all the way circularly in a circle back to where I started with Tootie Montana. BK Baptiste and the founding of the Creole Wild West in the mid 1880s. Well, we did a little genealogy. We looked up some facts and figures and we found some things that are a little paradoxical, but maybe make sense depending on how we look at them. Um, if that tribe was founded in the mid 1880s at BK Baptiste's house in the mid 1880s, it probably wasn't BK's idea because BK was 12 years old. Uh, he would have been maybe 14, 15 by the late 1880s, but clearly there's an issue there. So obviously that doesn't mean that what Tootie's saying wasn't true. It just means that he's retelling the story with BK Baptiste as the protagonist, when in fact the mover in the story and the reason it happened may not have been BK at all. It may have been his father. And indeed among the Mardi Gras Indians who we identified in the 19th century, most were born from the 1860s on. And they were all different people. Some were native French speakers and Creole Catholics. Some of them were uptown Baptists. Some were bricklayers, some were plasterers, some were draymen. There was no single commonality. But on many of them, when we went back one more generation to their fathers, discovered so many of their fathers were all black veterans of the Civil War. They had all been in the Corps d'Afrique, the Native Guard, uh, the United States Colored Infantry. And indeed, we found that these men also played a leading role in reconstruction politics, both as candidates, as organizers, in voter drives, as well as educational drives, et cetera. Um, so it could very well be that when Reconstruction ended, they stepped up as the leaders that they were and the leaders they had been for their country during the Civil War. And that was behind 
this organizing spirit, whether it was the benevolent societies who we know were organized then because it's written in stone in their, in their uh, tombs in the cemeteries, or whether that's also reflected in the founding of the Mardi Gras Indians. And indeed, in terms of dates, uh, one thing we were just absolutely tickled to find, uh, I remember calling up Shane when I found this, and we were like, man, it was like, you know, it was like the day they figured out how to put an Oreo together um, when we got this figured out. Uh, we found, and hit me if I'm given the wrong date, because it's been a while since we did this. It was 1879. Uh, we find this article, and it's the Times-Picayune reporter walking through the crowds on Mardi Gras, as, you know, I had done myself for decades for the Picayune, you know, so this was my, you know, my uh, spiritual great-grandfather in the newspaper business. He's walking through the streets on Mardi Gras, and he says, you know, something along the lines of, oh, what a display. It's, it's like everyone has on a mask. And everyone you see is a Mardi Gras. Here comes one now. Chickamofino, Chickamofino, they cry as an Indian chief makes his way through the crowd, shaking his tomahawk. Mm -hmm. So that was like, bingo. We've got someone dressed on Mardi Gras as an Indian saying something that I don't think somebody that just ran into the costume suit on the day before Mardi Gras would have been shouting on the streets. That certainly sounds like we're talking about a Mardi Gras Indian. So that's 1879. BK Batiste is five. So there's still more to be found. I think there's still another generational story to, to maybe hopefully unwind somewhere. But when people ask how old are the Indians, you can definitely say they were happening by the 1870s. I think you could say that with pretty good certainty. And when people say, yeah, well, what's that about them with Native Americans? You can go, yeah, that's pretty solid, too. Talk to Shane Leaf about that. <laughs> And that's, a, that's my conclusion. If anybody has any questions, Sarah, thank you. And thank you, Shane. I like your covert beard. <laughs> thank you both so much for sharing all of this wisdom and insight and the research that you have uncovered and the photographs that you've captured. Um, I see one question in the chat so far. If others have questions along the way, please feel free to add your questions. Um, I'm going to uh, read out this first one. And I think this is a question for both of you. Um, what has the reception of your book been? My sense is that many black masking Mardi Gras Indians have not been thrilled with books and articles written about them, um, including by Michael P. Smith, because researchers have not, until your book, um, emphasized or even believed their connection to native Indian culture. That's a great question, thank you. And that's my question. And I wanna say, um, uh, I meant to say, what's the reception been among the folks in the tribes that you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know any that have read it. Oh. Seriously, I don't know any Monk that have read it. hasn't read it. The Dallases haven't read it. Come on. Uh, somebody's got to yeah, have well, read it. Well, let me rephrase. If they've, heard, if they've read it, I've not heard. If you don't mind, I can answer partially. Um, I mean, this obviously is such a complex uh, cultural phenomenon and for obvious reasons, people have had a hard time addressing it. And I think it's because of the whole either or thing. And this happens in a couple of ways. Um, for example, uh, for um, many of my friends who are uh, native in Louisiana, some of them have mixed feelings about it. Some of them embrace it and they understand how things go. I, I think that this is a time in our history, I believe, where we're better able to deal with the complexities of blended history. So our ancestries are so complex, whereas in the past, there was more of a compulsion to either be one or the other, you know, to be of one origin or another origin. So that's one thing that we're 
we get into. The other thing is something that I think is very important is that in the past, people always had this question, either the Mardi Gras Indians are authentic, whatever that might mean for somebody, like as in really native, or it's just an imitation or it's an emulation. And the, the, the complex answer that we offer in our, the complex question is that it's both actually, because it's undeniable as John was pointing out, there's all these images of Indianness all throughout United States history, certainly in the 19th century. And that couldn't help but have an effect on everybody, both Europeans, uh, you know, whites, blacks, African-Americans, everybody. And we're, we're responding to that still, that imagery, but that doesn't cancel out the reality that people in Louisiana and other parts of the United States also have native ancestry, regardless of how they might be seen by other people. So it's both at the same time. And so when, when the Mardi Gras Indians are doing this, as John said, certainly coming out of the civil war. So during the reconstruction period, it was reinforcing previous traditions. So it, it's, it's not an either or like, oh, it just began after the civil war. Things had been happening before, but it is reinforcing earlier cultural traditions. But I think up until this time, people had such a hard time and it's still, it's, it's not easy to, to, to explain really. It's not, you can't explain it fully, but people had a hard time because they're always caught up on the either or thing, you know, either, either you're that. Still, I'm, I'm surprised your book has been out for a little while now since uh -huh. before yeah. Corona. Uh, there, you've given a number of talks in the city, Octavia, here and there. Uh, I would assume maybe folks from the Neighborhood Story Project or Fayaya folks or mm, who's the Uptown Indian? He's a lawyer. He's... Donald Edwards. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would assume you would have had a certain subset of Indians who like mm, like semi academic -y books and would have the then uh, written Dow something wrote. on a Facebook or a Dow, sorry, Edwards, uh, on a, at least a Facebook post, if not a full review for. Could I answer the question? Dow yes, wrote sorry. the blurb that's on the back of the book. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say privately, I mean, there's been a very positive reception, but institutionally, at least from the, let, I'll just say it this way, academic in the academic world, because I'm, I'm kind of amphibious, I'm part academic, part not. <laughs> um, I, I don't hear much institutionally, but as individuals, I mean, sure, people are very interested in the book and they have lots of questions just like tonight, you know, so. Um, but I, I, I do appreciate that question. It's, I think it's an ongoing challenge, really, it's to deal with this complex material. It's the first thing I've seen published on black masking so-called Mardi Gras Indians that really looks deeply into their connections with native indigenous culture in, with substantial research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I don't know of anyone else who's done what the two of you have done. Well, appreciate that. And I, I just want to add one more thing about academia. And this may not be a surprise to anyone, actually. <laughs> it shouldn't be. But there is a way in which people, there are legacies of interpreting history that are so strong that don't allow people to see things that are in front of their face, no matter how many books they've read. And I, I guess I'll call upon, uh, you know, Thomas Kuhn's, the, the um, uh, structure of scientific revolutions that people are caught in a paradigm of interpretation and they can't break out. And so if you study native culture, that's what you do, or, you know, that's your thing. Or if you study New Orleans music for so long, these were seen as not even related to each other. And years ago, I actually used to make physical journeys across Tulane campus, trying to bridge the gap between different disciplines, but people in their buildings are hermetically sealed against one another and including their ideas you know there's no there's no communication <laughs> so anyway between that's, yeah hmm. that's my jeremiah against uh, academia but that's that's all thank you and thank, thank you, you mr mccusker okay i'll mute thank you no that was a great discussion i appreciate it 
Um, we have a few and more seriously, questions. Seriously, if any, if if any of the fellows have read it, I mean, I spent twenty years around these guys. Uh, if any of them read it, uh, I'd love to hear feedback. Yeah, we should. Um, it'd be great to solicit some feedback and, and pull them into the conversation. Um, the next question is what has been the evolution of the elaborate costumes from the early 1900s until now? Well, um, Robbie Lee talked about when he was a young man that the suit was not as an elaborate affair. And indeed, if you look in Gumbo Yaya, there's some pictures of uh, Brother Tillman's gang, uh, the Yellow Pocahontas. Yeah, he was running with them then, and that was, uh, and uh, I think it was the Yellow Pocahontas is the goal, I forget it. But it, anyway, it's, not, it's around 1940, he's in a, uh, they're in a bar, and the Indian suit is mainly a headdress, which would look like a standard headdress like you would see on a cowboy movie back then. Um, you'd have a vest, which would maybe have some beadwork, and baubles and stuff, and then like a silk shirt, and then maybe the pants would have frills on the legs. And that was an Indian suit. Um, that was the 1940s. Um, Howard Miller uh, with the Crow Wild West told me that, that, you know, when he was a young man, you know, this is late 60s, early 70s, he made an Indian suit when he was a kid and went out and he says, you know, would it roll today? No but that was his first Indian suit. Um, definitely, you got to see by the late 60s and the 70s, they're really going in new directions. You've got new materials that are available. You're seeing people go into ostrich plumes a lot. You know, the early Indian suits were turkey feathers. Um, so, you know, the availability of materials and so forth and, and different media, uh, and then, of course, you know, when you look at what Tootie did, you know, the, 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 one of the things that Big Chief Tootie did was he really took the headdress and made and other parts of the costume and gave it a third dimension. You know, you can see on his Indian suits that you've got projections and you've got forms, which only makes sense. He was a plasterer, you know, and he knew how to make those forms and, and to craft this vision with his hands and uh and that was really something and now I, I would say more recently you'll see victor harris has embraced more of uh an african aesthetic so you're seeing conch shells and the like um uh you're seeing masking like you would see more in keeping with the bahamian junkanoo dancer um so you know it's constantly interpreting and reinterpreting. This is why Shane was talking about, um, you know, what's uh, authentic and what isn't authentic. What's authentic is what's happening. And things constantly take in stuff and new things around it all the time because, you know, those things cross our path and they can, they can enter the mix. Thank you. It's great. Um, the next question is actually for Shane. Um, could you please elaborate further on the direct connection um, with Native Americans and meaning specifically relating it to specific tribes or direct indigenous connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that it, first of all, it's, it's really hard to trace and there's a few things that I'd like to mention in connection with this is um, part of our story has to do with the development of different social classification systems and legal realities in Louisiana and how people got defined out of existence by the law or parts of their ancestry were excised and defined out of existence. So what you have are these different uh, laws that are passed where if someone has uh, let's say African, some degree of African ancestry, they then become either black or uh, Jean de Couleur or something like that, but the native ancestry is completely wiped out. So you have all these people in Louisiana who do have native ancestry, a lot of people, both white and black, 
but certainly in, in the black community, people with native ancestry, and it would be really hard to know necessarily what the, the tribal affiliations are. Um, this isn't to say that people don't know. I'm, I'm sure that they, that some of them do, but uh, I would say, and this is just kind of a long answer to say that the specific tribal affiliations are quite hard to trace uh, for a variety of reasons. But I would say in terms of just the connection to Native Americans, it is there, not just in the family legacies, but the fact that you've had Native people in New Orleans making music in the streets and people responding to that over the entire history of New Orleans. And once again, we're kind of blinded by assumptions that we have that somehow there was a time when all of a sudden Native Americans were no longer here or something like that. You know they've always been present. They're always here, but um, just learning to to all of a sudden, well, kind of bring that together and say, well, with those processions of music in the street, certainly people are are hearing that and picking that up and incorporating it into their own musical traditions. I mean, I'll give you a really quick example in another way. I did research on a Sicilian musician, um, Antonio Maggio, who was active in New Orleans uh, 120 years ago. And judging from the descriptions of where he was in public spaces, playing music with his friends, playing mandolin, part of a string band, it is absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, more than plausible that he crossed paths with Buddy Bolden based on where Buddy Bolden was in the barbershop where he was, you know, on a daily basis. So all these people were hearing each other and responding to each other. So in terms of Native American musical culture being part of the city, it's always been there. It's just not as well documented and well recorded, you know, in various ways, but it is there. And the tribal affiliations, I think that that's, well, we'll have to have discussions about this and look at some of the traces of, of details, but it's, it's, it's very, very hard to trace. Yeah, I wanted to, um, like, because part of what I hear here, and I haven't gotten the book yet, but I will be getting the book, um, because this is exciting um, work. And so if you address this, I just apologize from the beginning, because I don't have, I don't have the book. Um, but I think there's a lot of confusion between ancestry and direct, you know, living within a tribe, living within a nation. Mm -hmm. And ancestry is one thing. Um, and Elizabeth Warren is the best example of saying, I have Indian ancestry, but how does that influence? And I, I, I hear a bit of a mix of, of the influence that's happening on the street and with the music and how it's shaping and it's creating this sort of sui generis thing that's that is New Orleans and unique aspect to New Orleans. But the tribal question comes into play because is it is it just kind of a that Creole mix, that one more element of something that's influenced that's come in and that gets played out. And at a time when the Plains Indians were very much front and center on popular culture, um, that it gets blended and then created into something that's unique, but that doesn't bring it back to indigenous communities. Does that make sense? It's sort of like saying if you have Spanish ancestry and Irish ancestry and and different things. So um, and I think the language too when being called gangs moving to tribes, um, if this was called the Mardi Gras Creoles or the Mardi Gras pirates, um, people would look at it differently. But the word Indian is there. And so I think there's always that kind of gray area of, of what does that Indian mean? Is it? Okay, I, I think I could take a swing at that uh, off the bat. One of the things that we talk about is um, is why is answering the question why would you know leaving off bloodlines and, and DNA and seven degrees of Kevin Bacon if if we just go directly to um, why would a why would an African-American person in post-Reconstruction New Orleans read 1878, choose on Mardi Gras to costume as an American Indian? What's going on right around that time? Well, you big just have to stand, you know. Bingo. Yeah. So, what better way, you know, and I'm definitely one of those people that doesn't like to make black culture about reactions to white people, but in terms of just personal pride, 
what better character, what character to take on than one that was an active armed conflict with the United States government? You feel me on that? You are, you are a uniquely American figure, but you're an armed conflict with the United States of America. Sounds like a fellow traveler. So it's not about, you know, I know there's still a lot of tension about, you know, is this a mimicry? Is this a pantomime? Is this really just a, a minstrelsy of Indianness? But I think if you look at it in the context of the spirit of why those men, those first men, would have dressed that way and chosen to conduct, because it's not just a costume, it's ritualistic, almost combative dance. Uh, it's aggressive music. And, and, and early on, there was, there was, this was defending your neighborhood. You know, it wasn't just a Mardi Gras New organization. This could be your neighborhood and you're going up against another neighborhood. So there was shooting, there was all kinds of scrapes. People ended up in jail. You know, Brother Tillman shot somebody in 1923, I think it was. So this was all about identity and pride. And Mardi Gras being the vehicle, perhaps, to, to be that fellow traveler as a resistance figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, I totally agree with that. It's a sense of empowerment. I mean, you can see where you're taking this on and in an age of when you're about to go into Jim Crow and everything that gets ugly, it allows you to display power and pride in a way that um, is all other avenues are, are being curtailed. Um, oh, and, and yeah, and on a more 10,000 foot level, I mean, what is any costume about? You know, this is, you know, why on Halloween, you know, Suburban people go out and dress in, you know, grotesque or slutty costumes and stuff, you know, because that's not who they are the rest of the time, right? Well, they, right. And there's one thing I'd like to add. So it's also not not just the symbolism we're talking about. So, Laura, to speak to your question about tribal affiliation versus ancestry, I think that the difficulty there was that people were being told that they were one thing and they're actually many things. In some cases they may not have known and, and they may not know just like people uh, with African ancestry won't always know exactly where all the tribal affiliations or earlier affiliations they may have had, um, their ancestors had. But I think that that's the reason why it's so difficult is because the documentation is, is lacking there. Um, but I don't, I think that the authenticity that we might seek from someone, let's say, who has lighter skin, who's European American, who makes claims like Elizabeth Warren did, the onus is a bit different than on someone who's African American, who has a different history of being told that they're not what, who they claim to be. So, but I, but the, the thing is, I, I see what you're saying that there's a question of tribal affiliation. It's not very clear though, uh, but I think that there could be a lot of conversations that have to take place if, to find that out. You know, we're kind of sketching out just the mere, like let's say that the foundation that there, there is native ancestry there. Uh, for the longest time people were told you're either this or you're that, but they're actually both at the same time. Now as to who is what tribal affiliation, I, I don't know. That, that's, that's another kind of investigation, I think. Yeah, yeah, and suffice to say, I mean, like you would have whole tribes chain, right? Like the Chitty Macha that are basically wiped out, mm -hmm. you know, and what survivors, well, I'm sorry. No, the Chitty Macha are not well, totally wiped out. Uh, right. I, I'm, I'm the Natchez, and, and you would have, you would have the French were very good at pitting one group against each other right. um, in that way, but it, it may actually, you know, the, the bloodlines and so forth, like Shane says, is it's never one way or the other. Yeah, I'm not and concerned about the bloodlines. No, I don't think yeah. bloodlines it makes culture. Um, and But no, what I was saying was, it, you know, among the, the stories that I read, they talked a lot about Eugene Honoré, and you'll see him mentioned in the book. Uh, Eugene Honoré was seven feet tall, um, his father had fought in the Civil War. He lived in the French Quarter. And he's credited by at least a couple of guys as being the composer of Indian Red. Mm -hmm. um, 
they said that he was mainly whatever that means choctaw indian and that they called his mom miss choctaw and that sometimes eugene would disappear for weeks and go stay somewhere outside baton rouge mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. that could be point coupe that could be that could be a lot of things mm -hmm. um but you know it's not either or like shane said it, you know, you, you can have both at the same time or need, you know, or, or not. And, and there are examples of like, just again, just an example out of the hat is, uh, you know, George Lewis, uh, the clarinetist who certainly had Choctaw ancestry. It is, it's absolutely known based on his family history. But that's, uh, again, I think that that's, it's a really important aspect. And but it's something that needs to be elaborated upon, you know, in terms of like tracing out tribal affiliations. But the, the main point is that native ancestry is there. And for such a long time, people were assuming that it was merely a representation thereof, you know. Can I ask, what about the, um, the, the theory I've always heard also is that, um, that during slavery that the, the indigenous tribes offered some manner of safe harbor to the runaway slaves and that that developed some manner of a relationship and a gratitude um, toward the native tribes is that that wasn't mentioned and I was wondering about it. Sure I, I mean that's true but it is such a mixed record in terms of who was doing what for whom because a lot of times uh, yeah. native allies of the French who would actually track down runaway slaves and that kind of thing too. So it's, it's impossible to say, this is what the relationship was between this group and that group of people based on something as broad as say being native or having African ancestry. It, it was, and it depends on the decade too, you know? So, mm -hmm. but, but of course that happened as well, what you're describing in terms of mm -hmm. communities that were people kind of um, threw in uh, their, you know, uh, together and, and survived together. Sure, that happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting, I, I think sometimes when people, you know, we try to get the concept around, you know, talking about slavery, much less talking about running away from slavery, seeking freedom from slavery. Um, enslaved people running away was a daily occurrence. There were some that made a really regular habit of it. There were some that could run away and stay gone for six months. There were some, you know, that would get away and they'd catch them in Natchez. You know, if you read the, the, you know, the advertising and the printed material from that period, you'll see that running away to freedom wasn't necessarily an end game. You might be able to run away and kind of live not working for the master for a couple of months. But there was no like, you know, most runaways were it was a temporary state. It wasn't something that you could actually get to freedom. And, you know, you asked about intersections of Indians and and runaway slaves. Well, certainly, you know, if you're running away to places where the white man isn't, those are oftentimes going to be where the Native American people were. And yeah. and Shane you know, talks a lot in his section of the book about, you know, particularly cultural situations where you had crossovers between, you know, native peoples and enslaved peoples, both in musical contexts and a sports context mm -hmm. and in other celebratory contexts. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm conscious of the fact that we're running out of time. Um, so we have just a couple more questions. One being, um, was there satire involved on the part of mass Indians, especially satire about the white majority? Not that I've found, not that we wrote about, Shane. No, huh? No, no, not real. not, again, yeah. I, I think that there was a different kind of modality there. It's not to say that it didn't exist, but, um, yeah, we certainly didn't focus on on that. Um, but, uh, mentioned. Was that? <laughs> I don't think we even mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think, but it, but it's it's actually a very good issue though, which is to say, 
all of the different ways in which people were enacting one another, falling under the rubric of minstrelsy. And oftentimes you'd have cases, again, I, some of you may already be aware of this, but you have like early jazz and blues musicians, including Jelly Roll himself, who would dress up in blackface. And oftentimes it was this multi-layered commentary on the way whites were perceiving blacks, perceiving whites, perceiving blacks. So I, I, I would imagine that something like that would could always come up. It could always emerge in a, a context where someone is masking as another. Um, but yeah, and if you don't mind, I'm just gonna, just in case we don't get to it, I see that other question, but there's no support for the theory that the idea came from Wild Bill's show. <laughs> sorry, sorry, jumping on like that. But I, I wanna address this because earlier on, as, as uh, I was saying, it reinforced previous traditions. So there's no doubt that those Wild West shows were very significant. And we do talk about that in the book. We do address that uh, uh, quite, quite a bit but it's not reducible to that. It's not reducible to mere minstrelsy or something like that. It was um, something that was part of the, the wider cultural framework of the United States in the way that people in the United States were conceiving of Native Americans at a time when there were like continuing wars, you know, and the frontier was still expanding westward and, and with all the horrors associated with that. But, mm -hmm. but I just want to mention that the, the, the Wild West show that you're describing that clearly had an impact um but again it's not either or it's at the same time that you had these other traditions that had been uh, going on from before I, I think yeah and just so we don't get things conflated or tangled here i think and perhaps shane reads higher material than i tend to read I, but you may I, find uh, it very typically gets conflated that the origin of the Mardi Gras Indians was no doubt the Wild West show. Mm -hmm. So are we saying that? No. No. So I did want to put a point on that, but things right. don't have to be either or, but I think really to just kind of dismiss the whole thing uh, in terms of cart before the horse, we've got Indians on the streets five years before Buffalo Bill gets here. So, you know, again, as an origin thing, it's, a, it's, it's no, but could it have reinforced? Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Well, and then one more point too, is that we have to suspend our addiction to singular origin. You know, just like people, we all come from many different origins blending together in us and our bodies. Well, the same goes with any of this stuff is that it's, we can't trace it back to one origin, although we seem to wish to have an answer like that. Usually when one wants to understand like, oh, Giacomo, where does that come from? We can tell you the Muscogean nucleus of that, but there's so many other things that go into it that feed into it over time. So people are hearing those sounds and they're blending in European or African languages and they have different interpretations of that phrase. But so it's, it's, it's not <coughs> a single origin anyway. Yeah, Shane touches on this with a really interesting story about, uh, you know, early in the colonial period, uh, a Frenchman coming up on a native village and, uh, and he's being greeted not with a Native American fashion drum, but a European style, you know, military drum. And I guess in their minds, since this, this is apparently a gift from the governor and the idea, since they were greeting a, a European delegation, they should play their kind of drum and that that would be the decorum for that. Right. Fascinating to think about it. And then Shane, you also found one, the, the one with them using the vines on the drum to get a different sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in other words, the snare drum, the European snare drum, which uh, the Choctaw had incorporated into their traditions uh, a couple hundred years ago, at least, if not longer. And, uh, but that, yeah, that one encounter with Charlo uh, Charlevoix in the Akutisa village, there's evidence that that was in fact a snare drum, you know, a European, but it was, it was most certainly a European drum that had been given to the Akutisa earlier. And so as, as John's pointing out, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that is this, really peculiar reality that you never know where something's coming from. You might think it's really ancient 
and it's European or, or native or African, but you, you'll be surprised uh, because people were borrowing <laughs> way back then. It's not just now that we have crossover music and that kind of stuff. No, crossover music, that kind of idea of genre mixing was already happening centuries ago, time out of mind. Thank you. This has been such an incredible discussion. I want to give a quick plug also that um, this carnival season um, at the Presbyter, we have a new exhibition opening called Mystery in Motion, African-American Spirituality and Masking in Mardi Gras Indians. So another examination of this topic, um, looking at Mardi Gras Indians, but also at um, the Skull and Bones Gang and Baby Dolls. Um, so I hope you all are able to come visit. Um, but I really, I want to thank you, John and Shane, for your incredible wisdom um, and for the conversation that has taken place tonight. It's been great to hear from you both and see these images and also hear um, the questions from the audience. So thank you all for your participation. Um, we'll be sending out the link to the recording shortly along with a short survey. Um, if you're able to fill that out, it helps us to plan for future programs and, and bring new topics to the table. Um, thank, you thank you so you much all. for having us. And if I could just get the quick plug in, uh, the 1811 Kid Ori Historic House will be opening in the coming six weeks. Oh, so thanks. we have a bookstore. So if you don't have Giacomo, you can at least get half of the authors to sign it. And maybe we can <laughs> coax uh, Shane first to the barber and then we'll uh, see if he can okay. sign his name after I all this time. Sure. I think I can get maybe at least a half of myself there to, yeah, we'll have three quarters of it. Yeah, yeah. Throwing <laughs> off a Unabomber vibe, uh, buddy. I, I, you know, it's, it's like, you don't look like this when I met you, I wouldn't have done the book at all. I'm just going <laughs> to say that up front. I'm, I'm detecting an anti-beard kind of sentiment here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all I'll right, Sarah, we're done, we're done cut, cutting up. I haven't seen him since COVID. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I'm glad that we could be the um, the virtual setting to bring you both back together. It's been a real treat to have you. So thank you all so thank much, you. and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Yeah. It's cool.